Welcome to It's All Your Fault on True Story FM, the one and only podcast dedicated to helping you identify and influence the most challenging human interactions, those involving patterns of high conflict behavior. I'm Megan Hunter, and I'm here with my co host, Bill Eddy. Hi, everybody. We also have along today with us, Sonia Wood, who we'll be introducing shortly. We are the co-founders of the High Conflict Institute in San Diego, California, where we focus on training, consulting, and educational programs and methods, all to do with high conflict. In today's episode, we are talking with our brand new guest, Sonia Wood. She's from Texas, but I think you'll learn here shortly that she does not have a Texas accent. And you'll have to guess where she's from, or maybe she'll tell you a little bit about that. So Sonia's going to talk about mediation, and uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But first, a couple of notes. Send your high conflict-related questions to podcast at highconflictinstitute.com or on our website at highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast, where you'll also find all the show notes and links. Welcome, Sonia, and we're just very pleased to have you with us today. Uh, A little bit about your background for our listeners' sake is that uh, Sonia is a qualified mediator, having completed her training in 2019, and her specialization is in civil and business disputes. And we're going to talk all about mediation and her her new role in, in that way. One of the new roles is as the chair of membership for the Texas Association of Mediators. Brand new on the board of directors, and she'll talk a little bit about that. We met Sonia when she became a conflict influencer through our conflict influencer certification here at High Conflict Institute. She dedicates her time to volunteer mediation and actively supports dispute resolution centers across Texas. We'll talk about a whole lot more of her background as we go along, but she's done some really amazing things and been very proactive to become highly skilled at mediation, such as getting a certification in positive psychology to emphasize strengths and opportunities for improvement rather than dwelling on shortcomings. So let's start with Sonia. I would love to hear about your background um, and sort of your journey and your transition into mediation and into life in the U.S. Yeah, thank you. I'm really happy to record that with you, Megan and Bill. So my background is actually in chemistry. So I learned, I did a master at the university in France and graduated as a chemical engineer in 2014. And I started to work right away in Germany. So I, I basically always worked in Germany. Jobs were better. It pays better too. <laughs> so I got some experience in different companies, um, oil, gas industry, automotive industry. And I traveled a lot. I ended up, my last job was traveling a lot in Europe, in France, in Belgium, in Austria, in Slovakia, and within Germany to just support the customers. So that was giving me a lot of insight on how the communication was going between the company that hired me and the production sites uh, where the customers were. A lot of insight. Yeah, which is so helpful when you're doing mediations for business and, you know, in civil cases, just to have that that background knowledge, right? Yeah. And that because I was working close to the management and also close to production sites, I was able to know the different aspects, uh, the challenges from the manager, but also the challenges from the employees. And I was seeing where the communication was dysfunctional between both. And that was common to everywhere. That was not typically just one country or another. That was both Germany, France, both the same. Interesting. So you would, you saw the same issues coming up regardless of the country, the culture, just communication issues in general. Yes. Yes. And I had more 
difficulties in Hungary, for example. So more going into East Europe, where the culture is very different and they were not really accepting a young woman in a technical job. So that was my first, well, one of my first encounter with high conflict situations where nobody really knew how to deal with it. I was at that point, I was dealing with uh, discrimination and sexism. And I think the, the default behavior was just not really to talk about it because the loss of, for the company would be too great if the deal was going to be gone. So we were really trying to maintain the deal for the financial um, health of the company. And there's the, the human aspect of the work kind of suffered from it. Mm, yeah, it sounds like it. So I, I think for our listeners who are used to hearing so much about high conflict, this comes as a from a very different angle. Um, and I know we have listeners all over the world, so it'd be interesting to hear from you if you're listening to this, say, from Eastern Europe or any part of Europe and in your experiences, which leads me to a question about how much, uh, I mean, you mentioned that the human aspect suffered. So I would imagine that not a lot of attention is given to, you know, interpersonal skills training or conflict training. Would that be a true statement? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, there, there is no such thing as, um, conflict management. <laughs> um, that was not even concept, uh, being used. And basically, and you have to, to, to imagine this, this, the situation where you have a less experienced young woman working with, um, 20 plus years experienced employee. And if something goes wrong, if the man, if my manager doesn't show up, then there is an unbalanced power. So what happened at that time is I tried to open the door to talk about that, even just with my direct um, uh, boss at that point. But I think there is the fear of facing the conflict mixed with the goal, the financial goals of the company. And that had just really, I think, terrible consequences for the work after that, because I first, I lacked total trust in my own um, ability to deal with the situation. I like trust toward my manager. I like trust toward the whole company, because what happens if they're not supporting their employee in a crisis situation? And I just became totally disengaged in my work. So that has a lot of consequences. And the company faced a lot of turnover after that. Yeah, I'm not surprised. So it's it's fascinating to to discover, I guess, where where people started and and you know how they got to where they are. What what is that journey? And it's it's just so interesting. And I can see on Bill's face here that there, there's such a difference between uh, chemistry, right? Which is such a straightforward. I would think not that I even took chemistry in high school, but way more straightforward than than mediation. And you know what is that? So how did you make that transition from uh, that corporate chemistry engineering background into becoming a mediator? Well, after this um, episode in Hungary, I came back trying to resolve a little bit of something within the company, but I really faced only closed doors. So nobody wanted to talk about it. And at that point, I think it can be possible and nobody cares. It just can't. So I thought, okay, if the company is not willing to support the employees and be more efficient on crisis management, I'm going to learn how to deal with it. Um, because nobody knew how to face conflict, then I was determined to know how to deal with it myself. Um, so I looked for another path into management. And at that time was, um, 2016, 17 about, and there was a lot about happiness management, um, happiness manager. So I was trying to go in that direction, but I was not really convinced about the impact of that, um, the, the classes that were offered. And I came across conflict management. 
And it's how I went into mediation. So I took, then I was in Germany and I took a nine month class that was on weekends when I was still working and on weekends I was going into class and we were learning mediation and conflict management. And we did pra mediation practice and play a role for nine months. And it's how I became a mediator first. <laughs> was the company in Germany open to mediation and talking about issues? And was it just in Hungary that they weren't comfortable with that? Or was that also true a lot in Germany, except for the people training you in mediation? In other words, is it a cultural thing? Or were they really open to mediation in Germany now? When I learned mediation for in the first time, um, like we're talking about 2017, 18, it was starting to be more popular, but I don't think that the companies were really integrating conflict management into their management. Um, I think it really depends where you are in which company you're, you're working with. The one I was in had no idea about that. And the only times I was trying to talk about this, they just didn't want to. Uh, they just clearly let me know it's not my problem anymore. So to, to my opinion, there is no will to really try to solve something. Now, do you see that as generational? Is there a generational difference? Or is that just kind of throughout the culture or the business culture? That's an interesting question. I think there is both. And the the challenge that was with the situation in Hungary was there is a cultural aspect of it. And there is also generational, of course, because I was younger than everybody else. And I think the the deal was just too big to take the risk to lose it. Mm. That, that, and that was fine. And just then we have different priorities and different ideas about how to do business and different uh, values. But it's then the point where you decide if that company is still aligned to the values I have. Do I need to find another company or not? Um, I think startups and in, in Germany, and I'm thinking about Berlin, Berlin, maybe that is a little bit more hipster and open where you have maybe more startups. Um, the culture might be different and a lot more human focused. Now the, the area I was in was very, um, conservative and more, maybe more task focused, task focused. And we can say also, you know, a lot of things about equality, um, about genders, but still being a young woman among a lot of men in this, uh, production is historically is very masculine. Um, historically, I precise. I don't want to get, <laughs> to get in, in debate about that, but it, it was still a problem. You know, what's interesting is, you know, I teach a course once a year at Pepperdine, the law school on high conflict, uh, psychology of conflict. And last fall, I had four students from Germany and they were, I'd say, mid twenties. And they came really to learn about dispute resolution in the U.S. and Pepperdine is kind of neck and neck with Harvard at being top top dispute resolution uh, law schools. And I asked them, what are you going to do after, with your degree? Because I wondered if they were just going to stay put and say, oh, we're going to change Germany and open them up to much more mediation and conflict resolution. So they were, they were enthusiastic. And since there were four of them, I, I really believe they'll give each other a lot of support. But they also said that they think that the culture is ready now to really learn to use mediation instead of court, to use mediation to resolve business disputes, et cetera. So would you say that there was an openness, even though there wasn't knowledge much about it? Yeah, definitely. And when I took my class, for example, there was a police officer that took the class to become a mediator, not that he wanted to change his career path, but he wanted to support within the police um, a team 
in case of conflict. Mm -hmm. There is a bunch of teachers and they were already open. Um, mm -hmm. There is a really the, the path is going toward this. Now, I think a lot of companies are not startups. Um, maybe the, the generate, the generation before me or two generation before me. So in a more conservative mindset. And I think all the young people, uh, from my generation to after that want to change this and try to do management differently is definitely, uh, spreading. Mm -hmm. But it's not really a secret either that U.S. usually is a bit more advanced on, on this thing than, than Europe. <laughs> well, very good. Let's take a, a short break and we'll come right back and continue talking with Sonia. Hey, mediators, if you ever seem to get stuck in some mediations despite using your best skills, the same skills that work in most of your other mediations, it might be because one or more parties may have a high conflict personality. If so, there is hope for helping them. We offer a training for family mediators and another one for all other mediators to learn the necessary skills for handling your high conflict cases. Bill Eddy's settlement rates increased from around 75% in high conflict cases to above 90% using the new ways for mediation model he created. These trainings are a combination of on demand, which you can watch 24 7, and Zoom training directly with Bill. You'll find the link for this in the show notes below. Sign up at highconflictinstitute.com forward slash upcoming dash courses. Email us at info at highconflictinstitute.com or just send us a message through our socials. All right, we're back with Sonia Wood to continue talking about mediation and kind of the journey of a, of a new mediator. And uh, so the first question is how you got to the U.S. And then we're going to talk about some of the challenges you've encountered in becoming a mediator. So how I came to U.S. is not really original. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> 2018, I, I'm learning mediation and there is a lot in one year. There is a lot that changes. Um, at the same time, I'm uh, quitting my job in Germany. Um, I'm moving in with my now husband and I'm trying to create a new career based on conflict management. 2020, we decided to stay together. So I followed my husband that was at that point still in service in the army and moved with him to Texas. So it's how I came from Europe to the middle of nowhere in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a, a large change. It's not like moving from Europe to New York City or, you know, um, Texas is very, very different. And I guess every state is, but um, I'm sure that that came with some challenges. Speaking of which, when you got to Texas and began uh, your, your conflict resolution career, did you encounter any challenges trying to find training or how did that go about? Uh, yeah, there was a lot of challenges because arriving in a new country, knowing no one, uh, even if I've lived in, uh, in different countries and I traveled outside Europe, it's still not easy to start over. And that's basically what I did when I, I decided to follow my husband. It's to start over personally and professionally. So the first thing was to get to know people. And at that time I had the mediation certification from Germany, but I didn't know if I could do mediation within Texas. Also, because I had no idea about the regulation in Texas. So at that point, I decided to look for an association that was with mediators. And that, that's how I found just on Google, I found Texas Association of Mediators. Um, and that was the first step. But even after that, it took me a little bit time to understand, okay, what do I want to do? Do I want to retrain? in Texas or do I want to do something else? Well, I finally chose to do a new training to specific to Texas. And it's always good to relearn a little bit. Now the training was a lot shorter though in, in Germany, I had more than 200 hours training. 
um, the Texas certificate, the Texas basic training is 40 hours. Right. So it's a lot shorter, but I needed to have those little ethics and Texas regulation details to do mediation better here. What kind of mediations you were attracted to? At that point, I was already going into business mediation and civil mediation um, because of my background, knowing, uh, having a background with chemistry and techniques, technical aspect of the industry. I think I know quite good what challenges um, the management can face in, in oil and gas industry or automotive industry, and they're pretty pretty similar whatever industry you're in and what challenges you can have between the management team and the employee. It's an interesting thing that as new people move into mediation, most people that I know, including myself, came from another career. So it was really a a mid-career change. But what we're seeing and hoping is that more young people like yourself can get into it earlier and what's helpful is that you have some background. So it's not your first occupation out of college, but pretty quickly you got some experience and then have now moved into mediation. So have you done anything with other types of mediation, like divorce mediation, things like that, interpersonal stuff? I've taken the class when last year with you, actually, Bill, when uh we, I was looking at uh, conflict, high conflict mediation, and we had a practice about a family case. So that was um, the closest to family mediation uh, training I've done so far, and I'm planning to do the proper family training, um, family mediation training this summer. But I, I've actually done a co-mediation with a CPS issue. Not everybody can do family mediation. Then that's my personal opinion. Um, it just, I think family mediation triggers a lot of things. So if you're not clear with your own issues, it's going to be hard to do family mediation uh, as a mediator um, and being efficient as a mediator. That's really good awareness to have. And I, I totally agree with you. And there's some people that want nothing to do with it. Um, and a few people that want to do it, but it's not good for them. <laughs> but I'm glad you're getting to co-mediate something like that so that you're not thrown in the deep end of the pool of family mediation. Yeah, that was a, that was a good experience that uh, clearly let me know it's maybe not what I want to do. <laughs> Now, I still want to take the training because I still want to have an open door um, if the dispute resolution, resolution center needs a family mediator for it. But um, I'm not myself going to advertise my services for family mediation. That's that's a lot of things. Um, also, because I'm just learning the Texas legislation. And when you're going into the family law, you have so many things to know to be efficient in mediation. Just talking about child support seems an easy topic, but it's not, it's very difficult to understand what is around the, the law around child support. Um, so I need to catch up on that too. Um, and I don't think you can be efficient as a family mediator. If you don't have an, a good idea about the law around divorce, absolutely. Uh, so, like Bill said, it's it's good you you know where your strengths are and where maybe your your services are are best suited. So let's uh, talk for a moment about high conflict, which is you know where the High Conflict Institute podcast. How did you get to us, and and um, we'll kind of. I guess, talk about um, what dimension this has added to your mediation that you provide. So my first research about something else than mediation led me to high conflict. So 2020, I received, I was still in Germany. I received my certification as mediator. And yet I still feel I need to know more, but I came to the end point of what I can learn with them. So I looked through information about 
more about mediation. I didn't know high conflict yet, but I was looking for more information. And then I came across the high conflict institute and that concept of high conflict. And when I read about that concept, it's like a light bulb above my head that just went on. Because suddenly I could realize why some personal relationship were not making any improvement despite nine months working on myself and learning mediation tools. Some relationship were not going anywhere. So when I read about the high conflict personality, I was, this is it. This is exactly what's going on. And then that just um, gave me the the drive to know more and more about that. Fascinating. So I know you've, we've talked in the past quite a bit about Biff and that you're a, a big fan of Bill's book, Biff, the original Biff uh, book. We call it Biff Red because the cover is red. So how did that impact your, your work and even other relationships? When I got that book, I think it's important to really do all the exercise of the book um, just for, for yourself at, at first. And that unlocked a lot of things that get me to the point where I was able to take, to, to put distance between me and the situation or me and the other person. By understanding, I was able to not take it more personally or not to get emotionally involved. When I realized that in mediation, and even if you look around in the street or in a grocery store or on the road when you drive, there is a lot of high conflict people. <laughs> so putting this in application was really life changing because it's not just, it's not just a good tool for me and my personal relationship, but it's also a good tool for every day, everywhere. And. In family mediation, we were talking about family mediation. Family mediations are maybe, I don't know, percentage, but I think it's most of the time it's just high conflict situation because highly emotional. And I'm still surprised that a lot of mediators within the Texas Association of Mediators have no idea about high conflict. They're really good tools, like the ear model, um, cars, or uh, just beef response. They're all such good tool for every day. Well, what's exciting is that you're learning this stuff while you're also meeting new people and spreading the word of these methods. Because over and over again, we, we get what you said, that it a light bulb went off, that things made sense, certain relationships that didn't change, now they made sense. And you see what you can do. And what's interesting, we get feedback that the Biff method, which was designed for writing to be brief, informative, friendly, and firm, and that a lot of people now say they're starting to use it in conversations. And that I have this theory, I don't know, I can't prove it yet, but my theory is as people practice the Biff method, it somewhat rewires their brain towards how they deal with other people to be brief, informative, friendly, and firm rather than overwhelmed or overly aggressive. So I'm excited that that you like it and you find it such a wide use and that you'll be spreading the word about it as well. I, I really believe it too that when you start to apply uh, often what, what are what's in the book, um, the, the beef books, all the series of beef, then you try, you, you start to talk differently. You start to use different words and to approach the situation differently, um, compared to what you used to do. So I really believe that something changes in the brain too, um, because you, 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 you shift your be own behavior. So something must happen. And that's one of the themes of the Biff method. And anybody that gets a Biff book, by the time you get to the end of the Biff book, you see that the way you respond influences the way the next person responds, whether they have a, a defensiveness that we associate with the right hemisphere of the brain or whether they have problem solving that we associate with the left hemisphere of the brain. So you can influence which kind of response you get. And I didn't realize that when I first wrote 
wrote these, but now it just kind of settled in. Yeah, you really can decide how the other person's going to respond to you. Which is a you know a good testimony for why we shouldn't leave everything to AI. Right. Um, sure, I might be able to write something that's mildly predictive, but probably doesn't quite do the job. But the the flip side of that is you're not learning the skill and thereby you're not influencing someone else as well. So we're all about the skills. And Sonia, we really appreciate your support of, of BIF and um, and being so excited about it. We'll kind of wrap it up with that. Except one thing, I wanted to ask you if you have any advice or a tip for anyone who is either a new mediator, brand new in their career, or someone who's maybe considering it. Well, they need to join the Texas Association of Mediation, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, becoming a mediator is highly challenging uh, because it's not like you go to university and you, you send your resume to companies and they're going to hire you. When you decide to become a mediator, you're basically saying, I'm going to create my own job and I'm going to be uh, self-employed. It's truly important to be aware of that, that if you want to be a mediator, that means you need to know how to build your own business, how to network and, be, and get the skills for it. So joining association is a good way to network and learn more and more about how successful mediators did it. Um, that's personally what I do. Yeah, it, it's a very gratifying job. I think it, it's, I see it as highly important today. And it's going along the line of beef, being able to self-regulate. Beef is just that. It's a self-regulation tool. Right. Being able to self-regulate is to me one of the, if not the most important thing we have to do today, each of us. Uh, unfortunately, not enough people do it. So becoming becoming a mediator is um is showing the path towards self regulation, but to do that you must be aware that you need to self regulate yourself, and you must be ready to do what it takes to build that business. Yeah, two di you know very different skills, but ultimately you know those who really apply themselves and keep learning and applying themselves will will probably succeed as you have and continue doing. So we're very excited you've enjoyed joined us uh, at HCI and um, and thank you for joining us today on our podcast. We're hoping that we can get into the French speaking communities in other parts of the world and probably German. I think you speak three languages, yes? Yeah, I don't know what my German <laughs> is going to become over time, but I can I can still understand and speak a little bit. Oh, I'm sure you do great. So again, thank you. And thank you listeners for uh, joining us today. Next week, we're going to talk about the results of our polls on marriage and women and on child custody. So those polls are still open. You have time. We'll put the, the links in the show notes. It only takes about 30 seconds to, to complete each poll. Uh, send us your questions to podcast at highconflictinstitute.com or submit them to highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast. And we'd love it if you'd tell your friends and colleagues about us. And we'd be grateful if you'd leave us a review. Until next time, keep learning and practicing these skills. Be kind to yourself and others while we all try to keep the conflict small. It's All Your Fault is a production of True Story FM. Engineering by Andy Nelson. Music by Wolf Samuels, John Coggins, and Ziv Moran. Find the show, show notes, and transcripts at truestory.fm or highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, please consider doing that for our show. Mm -hmm.